one of our customers said that buying a Facebook ad is more expensive than a Fifth Avenue store. And definitely Instagram, Facebook, Google are like extremely, extremely expensive and I don't think it's going to slow down. So the question is, how do you win? And you win by building a community. You win by giving your customers a great experience. We've heard it time and time again on the show. Word of mouth, organic content, natural looking content. That's the way of the future when it comes to marketing and seeing good results. And in this big e-commerce boom, brands are constantly working to build buzz for their products and thinking of how to utilize strategies like that, whether it's through ratings, reviews, social posts, or unique ad campaigns. But the one highly coveted strategy that's been bubbling to the top of the stack and every e-commerce leader knows it's the way of the future, what do you think it is? Yep, user-generated content, UGC. And a company called Yachtpo is here to help with that. Yachtpo is one of the top platforms that companies such as IKEA, 1-800-Flowers, and Chubby's lean on to help them build communities, generate UGC, and create loyalty programs that yield the kind of engagement that most brands only dream of. On this episode of Up Next in Commerce, I asked the co-founder and CEO of Yachtpo, Tomer Tegrin, to give us an inside look at how Yachtpo is generating five times more engagement and content creation than what a typical brand may see. Plus, we also dove into the future of loyalty programs and personalizations. My one sentence takeaway from this interview, lean heavily into loyalty programs and maybe let off the gas a bit on personalization, which goes against what many people have said on the show. But I'll let you hear from Tomer around why he thinks this. Plus, hear why he calls his company a flamingo instead of a unicorn like most tech companies. Enjoy. Up Next in Commerce is brought to you by Salesforce Commerce Cloud. Respond quickly to changing customer needs with flexible e-commerce connected to marketing, sales, and service. Deliver intelligent commerce experiences your customers can trust across every channel. Together, we're ready for what's next in commerce. Learn more at salesforce.com slash commerce. Before we get into the episode, I would love it if you could hit subscribe and give the show a rating and review. I really wanna know what you think and hear how we're doing. All right, on to the interview. Hey everyone, and welcome back to Up Next in Commerce. This is your host, Stephanie Postles, CEO at mission.org. Joining us today is Tomer Tagren, the co-founder and CEO of Yachtpo. Tomer, welcome. Hey, thank you for having me. I'm excited to have you. I, you might not know this, but a couple guests who've come on the show actually have mentioned you guys. We had uh, the CEO of Live Tinted come on and a couple more. And they said your company- In a good way or in a bad way? In an amazing way. They said it was game changing. So thank you, thank yeah, you. when I saw you coming on, I told our producer, Hillary, I'm like, this is awesome. So serendipitous. But in your words, I'd like to hear what is Yapo and why did you start Yapo? Yeah. So you want the, the short version or the long version? Long, if it has a lot of little interesting tangents, you do whatever yeah, you want. Yeah. So I'll give you like maybe the opening gambit about your point. Then I'll tell you maybe the story in a more detailed way. The best way to think about Yotpo, if in retail, it was about location, location, location. Online, it's about consumer attention. And in a world where every brand is an e-commerce brand, right? From uh, Stephanie and Tomer, t-shirt company.com up to PNG, everyone is fighting over consumer attention. And that's what we do. We help e-commerce brand win over consumer attention by consolidating the marketing stack and really enabling them to build great experiences for consumers because that's the only way to win over consumer attention. We actually started as a reviews company and we started from a very, uh, 10 years ago, from a, a personal story that we had a friend uh, in my group of friends that each year made fun of us that we didn't buy him anything for his birthday. So 11 years ago, we decided to do something and uh, he was big on photography back then. So he bought him like a photography course. And because I'm the geek, I searched online and I found him like a fancy SLR camera. So we bought him that, he was super happy. But what happened is that the teacher after the second lesson told him that, we bought him the crappiest camera we could have bought him. And all of my friends made fun of me. And then I went back and I saw that my decision was based on reviewers named like Stephanie123. Oh, no. And I don't know anything about it. Yeah. And, and then I said, okay, let's, let's do that. Very, very good. And basically fight authenticity uh, of reviews. So we built in our entire technology based on that. And like making sure that whoever writes reviews is a real person that actually bought a product. If she or he are an expert in the field, we'll also let you know. And we really were able to disrupt 
let's call it the reviews in e-commerce, especially on the SMB, it was also a great time. We were much luckier than smart. It was like a great time to enter e-commerce or e-commerce marketing. And so we grew with a lot of like, you know, the Shopify, the e-commerce. So we were very focused on the lower end at the beginning. And now we have, you know, IKEA and PNG and 1800 Flowers, but we were for years focused just on the lower end. And I think five years ago, we understood that the bigger problem for e-commerce brands is that they're super busy, they're very small and nimble, and they have just too many point solutions to deal with. So we need to consolidate everything because the, the consumer experience actually flows through each one of them. I'll give you like one example. I, I remember one of our customers telling me like a few years ago, he said, look, Tom, when someone gives me a one-star review, I still ask for a referral. And that's the dumbest thing I can do as a brand, right? Like, yeah. of course, but they just weren't able to connect those dots together before we opened. So we completely re-architecture. We, we went through a lot of different things to make sure that, you know, it's like one platform to really help you win over consumer attention. It was like something very, very uh, important. That's our mission in life today. Since then, we built two more products. We acquired two more companies. We completely re-architecture the, the platform itself. We changed the go-to-market engine. We've been through a lot. And now we are in the pace of adding a, a new product every, let's say, 18 months. Wow. That's a lot of new products because, yeah, I was looking through everything you did. I'm like, okay, you do reviews, you do referral programs, you do, you know, smart loyalty programs. And everything seems like every time I talk to a commerce brand, I do always think like, wow, you guys have so many tools and technologies you have to plug into. Like, how do you keep track of it all? So what does the marketing tech stack look for someone when they come to you? Like, what yeah. kind of things are they like, hey, can you help us consolidate all these crazy processes? Yeah, so usually customers don't come with us to consolidate. It happens, but not a lot. We actually build the company that we, we commonly just fit, you know, have five different products in the market, user general reviews, what we call VMS. It's a visual marketing suite, a referral product, a loyalty product, and an SMS marketing product. And working on two malls, one of them is going to be launched, let's say, in two quarters, another one in like four quarters. And basically, you, you start with one like you can start with just loyalty or actually SMS now is our fastest growing part of the business. And then we show you that through the synergies in the product, it actually makes sense for you to, so I'll give you an example. If you like launch a loyalty program, the best way to communicate with your most loyal customers is through SMS. Mm -hmm. So we make it very easy for you if you want to send, a, you know, a loyalty campaign for customers that are likely to buy in the next 90 days and gave you a five-star review and referred a friend, to send them an SMS with a new loyalty offer, we make it very, very easy for you. Where in the other architecture, it literally uses of taking like weeks to, I don't know, orchestrate all of that. So for us, you can start with whatever product you want. It doesn't matter for us. That's how we build everything because we don't want to force the customer to consolidate. And once you start seeing the synergies and it makes sense, that's where the exponential value starts. So actually in our high touch customers, we see now that like, more than 60% of the customers are actually buying and using two plus products. So they are multi-product customers. And, and that's like something super, super important for us. And the, from time to time, customers come to us to consolidate, uh, but not always. Yeah. Awesome. And just to give a little context to tell me about some of the recent news around funding that maybe you guys yes. just went through, like how big are you and who are some of your clients, like name drops and people, if you can, just yes. so our audience knows, like y'all are legit. You're on the Unicorn status, I'll call you that. You might be like, don't yes. call me that. I just did. I actually have a joke in the, in the fundraising that we did. So we just closed like a $210 million round at the $1.4 billion valuation from like great investors and definitely on our path for the next stage to become a public company. Mm -hmm. And I always I had a slide actually in the fundraising deck that said that despite of the valuation, we are not a unicorn, we are a flamingo. We are building a flamingo. <laughs> And why is that? Because a flamingo is like a real animal and we are building like a real business to provide real value to customers over time. It's a very unique animal. And so it actually like part of our culture is a, it's a joke, but <clears throat> it's actually something very, very, that we take very seriously. So I love that. Some of our customers, Ikea, uh, Unilever, One Attendant Flowers, and we also have like 30,000 paying customers. So a lot of like the, the cool brands, you know, the, the Chubbies, the Away, the Movement, like all of the poster childs of D2C as well, usually 
choosing Yotpa, but also some of the largest brands in the world. And I think they come to us usually because our products are really, we like to call it like easy to start, easier to scale, and really trying to think about the merchant and really trying like not to use buzzwords, not to use fancy things, just like really helping those brands like grow faster in a very direct way. And I don't know, like we are 500 people or a little bit less, and I don't know any other like group of people that are so focused on helping brands win over consumer attention. Like that's literally what we think of every day. And also I think that like e-commerce is one of the largest changes of our generation. And we believe that we have a really short to become one of the most important companies in the history of commerce. And I always tell like the company internally that I, tell you, I have two young boys. And one of the things that like, for me, I want them to, to think about your boys, you know what? They were like a huge driver for, forward for that something that called like the digitization of retail or the shift to e-com or whatever you want to call it. And very much we are super, super passionate about like helping those brands. That's amazing. And congratulations. That's awesome funding, Thank awesome you. investors. I mean, yeah, really cool. And I love that flamingo reference. I want to use that just for myself now. That's <laughs> be, we, we, like, we call it like uh, be a flamingo in a flock of pigeons. So that's like our phrase internally. Oh, that's good. So, I mean, it seems like the perfect time right now too, because customer acquisition is getting really expensive. Everything I've heard on the show is that, you know, organic, natural, UGC, like that's what's working now. Tell me a bit about how you think about the customer acquisition world and why organic natural content or reviews helps more than anything else right now? Yeah. So it's a great question. So first of all, we uh, maybe share like a funny story. Let's say six months before COVID started, we actually uh, had like a customer advisory board. We meet customers and we ask them questions. And one of the phrases I uh, that stuck with me is that one of our customers said that buying a Facebook ad is more expensive than a Fifth Avenue store. Uh, and definitely like, you know, like Instagram, Facebook, uh, Google are like extremely, extremely expensive. And, and I don't think it's going to slow down, right? It's like, uh, there won't be like a lot of other consumer fronts, at least in the, the near term horizon. Uh, and when you add on top of that Amazon, so the question is, how do you win? Uh, and you win by building a community. You win by like giving your customers like a, a great experience. And part of that means like social proof. Part of it means like making sure that you are very transparent. Part of it means that you need to focus on like customer lifetime value mm -hmm. because it's so hard to bring. You need to make sure they're coming back. So loyalty, I can tell you it's like really top of mind. And for us, we entered loyalty in 2018. We are now like the fastest growing loyalty platform for e-commerce brands and we power some of the most sophisticated loyalty programs out there and it's just like amazing to see that you know even in i don't know the, one, one of the things even in the election there were brands that you know giving points for customers that showed that they voted and there are customers that hate the point system because it's, they lose their brand and they just have like a vip tier experience which is super awesome there's so much to do with that which is uh, fascinating to see how much brands are are able to innovate so i think we definitely live in a world, to your question, and circle back, that whatever works, you cannot win just by, I don't know, being great in pay anymore. Mm -hmm. Like, it doesn't scale. It can scale to a certain amount, but it won't forever. And now the question, how do you build your brand? And you build your brand by your community. And that's what we are very, very focused on as a company. So what are the ways that you advise your brands to build that community? Especially if you come and you're like, I don't have a community. <laughs> like, where do I yeah. even start with that? Because I would think you need to acquire customers first, but then that's pricey. So then you're not even thinking about retention yet because you don't have anyone to retain. Like, what are the maybe building blocks to even get to that next level? Yeah, I'll share a story. Are you familiar with Chubby's? Yeah, yep. The brand? Mm -hmm. So Chubby's, they have like a great story on how they started. It started from like an email that they used to send. And I don't know if you ever saw one of those emails. You know, super straightforward, so targeted to the buyer persona because they were the, the, the buyer persona. And it's a really like great group of founders that were just, you know, able to provide great content. And their customers actually want to buy Chubbies mm -hmm. because they feel that this is the brand for them. And you have movement that were very, very early on, very, very good on like Instagram ads. And I think today it probably means that you need to do everything well. There is not like a hack 
So you, you got to like at least experiment with, so uh, with paid, you got to experiment with content, with organic, like you have to invest. But in, in general, when you look at like mission driven brands, like the founders are usually, you know, all they are the buyer persona mm-hmm. or they know the buyer persona very, very well. And then it's just become easy. Like do stuff that are interesting for you, right? Do stuff that you would like to buy from. And I think that's where we see like the brands that are growing the fastest at the moment. I think there was also like probably a year, a year and a half ago, there was a huge trend in like drop shippers Mm -hmm. that's now actually like declining, which is a good thing. And I think it's easier for brands now to to stand out. So I think that the bad news is that you need to do good in like multiple fronts. But the good news is like there's so much demand at the moment for like great brands that you just need to focus on your buyer persona. Yep, that makes sense. Another interesting thing that I was reading about was how ads that have reviews in them are like the highest converting ones, which makes sense. I mean, I even think about, you know, if I see someone's picture with a review on it, like an organic picture, I don't want just the product picture. Or even if that came out and showed me like five stars, like check it out, I would go there all day versus a normal ad. So it's, it's actually something we built a few years ago. And the hypothesis was, it was also based on our customer feedback that they think that social ads with social proof we work great on social media yeah. and that makes sense, right? And, and then what we did is we made it like super easy and we work with like Facebook and Instagram to make it like easy to incorporate your user generated content. And then we started to experiment with that. And we learned that, you know, like the, the, the studio photos that you have actually work like worse than real authentic uh, customers photos. Mm-hmm. So we really build like a lot of technology to encourage customers and how do you get more photos and then make it just very, very easy for you to use it on your social ads. And, and it works like phenomenally well. And I think in general, you know, one of the key learnings that we learned as a company that we're established to, to establish trust between brands and consumers. That's what we found at the company. I think that especially if you are like a, a newer brand and you're just now starting, you have to focus on like, how do you create trust? And the best way to create trust is by like, what really people are saying, like I can share with you endless amount of data showing you that like products that just have five star reviews convert much worse than like 3.8, mm-hmm. which is insane, right? But yeah. it makes sense because nobody believes everything is perfect. And, and authenticity, transparency are so key in a world where, again, customer acquisition cost is super expensive because if you were able to bring a customer and she or he had a bad experience, it's like bad unit economics. Like you cannot scale that business. Yep. Yeah, I think the interesting thing too about organic reviews, even if they have like a 3.8, is that you can oftentimes go in there and find, you know, oh, this person's talking about something that I really don't care about. I mean, I'm even thinking about this and maybe, uh, Tomar, you're in the same place where it's like looking at daycares, preschools and all this. And some of them have yeah. like a four star and people are complaining about the wait list of like, I didn't want to pay a wait list fee. And you're like, "Eh, okay, like that shouldn't have brought it down, but that's real. And now I trust it a bit more. And now I'm interested in exploring it and not just looking at like a high level review. But what I wonder is how do you get people to review? How do you get them to, you know, submit photos? I mean, I don't have the time a lot of times, even though I love products, I'm like, "Mm, I just don't have time for it. Like, how are you incentivizing customers to do that? Yeah. So I'll share a few stories that uh, I think you'll find uh, funny. When we started, you know, we, we didn't know a lot on the reviews industry. And so what we did, Amazon, Amazon has a page called Amazon Top Reviewers. Mm-hmm. Like these are people that wrote, I don't even know how many reviews, right? And yep. so we, we looked at their like uh, names or, or handlers and we searched those people on Skype and Twitter and we like bombed them and, and wanted to interview them. And we spent hours and hours interviewing uh, Amazon Top Reviewers and uh, I think it was eBay top reviews, just trying to understand like why people write reviews, right? What incentivized them to write reviews and why other people are not writing reviews. And that's how we like formed a new approach on like review, the reviews industry. And I think definitely like we make it easy for you. So you talked about, you don't have time. We build like a technology called like email review that you can do the review inside the email. It's one step. It's really easy to do. So that's super, super important. The second thing that's really, really important is knowing when to, to ask for a review. So for example, when you buy, I don't know, a mattress, you need to experience with the product a little bit more before you will be willing to give a review versus, I don't know, a t-shirt. Mm-hmm. So I think those are important. The last thing that I can tell you, which is 
really, really interesting. And this is why like user generated content is so connected to like, uh, to loyalty is once you identify who are customers that are likely to be loyal, those customers are much more likely to generate content for you, photos, videos. So after someone, I don't know, upload a photo, I can tell you now, if you're not a Yotpo customer, ask them to join your loyalty club. There's like five X more chances that will happen, right? So how do you take one interaction of a consumer with your brand and translate it to the next step? And how do you take them in the customer journey step by step by step? That's why we are big believers that the, you need to consolidate the marketing stack because it is one customer, one journey, and it's not silo. Like it's a frictionless experience is knowing when to ask and knowing who to ask. It's super, super important. And I think when we started Yotpo, we always heard the phrase of that, you know, 1% of people write content, 9% of people uh, reply to that content, and 90% uh, are just reading that content. Today, we are more closer to like 5 to 6% are generating content almost, which is like a 5x or 6x improvement when we started. And a lot of it is like consumer behavior. A lot of it is our technology. And a lot of it, I think, is just like brands are evolving and understanding the importance of that. But it's just like fascinating when, when you ask about like photos, for example, there are brands that you would never imagine, never in your life, that people will, I remember I was scrolling to one of our websites and they were saying they, they are selling metals, like literally metals? blocks of metals. Okay. All right. That's what they sell. And they have like thousands of reviews, thousands of reviews. People write reviews and super passionate reviews. And we also have like an NLP engine, like a natural language processing that can give us and the merchant, you know, positive sentiment, negative sentiment and show you the score. Mm -hmm. People are super passionate about it. And apparently, you know, people are passionate for like different people are passionate for different things. You just need to find those people that are passionate about what you build, which that's what I always find like, you know, super, super uh, inspiring. That is a really yeah, interesting take though around like how you just need to have that passionate audience and finding them. But what also also is interesting is how you guys are ingesting the data in ways that, I mean, I think have been there for a while, but like you keep saying, consolidating it. I mean, I've always thought like, okay, you get all these good reviews, but oftentimes, you know, I might not want to see the review for 99% of the products that I'm not looking at. Like if I'm looking at socks at a company that has like a hundred SKUs, I really just want to be able to zoom in on the reviews of yeah. those socks and not see everything else. Even more than that, what we did now, if you go to Yotpo customers, is we build like a, an NLP engine, a natural language processing that can pull up uh, topics mm -hmm. from the content, right? So let's say if you, I don't know, to take your uh, preschool example, if you want to, you know, just read about the waiting list, you can click waiting list and read just all the content talking about that. Mm -hmm. You want to read about the teacher, about the food, about whatever you want, you can. So especially on mobile, I can tell you that really, really increases conversion because who has the time to scroll through like 300 reviews, right? Yeah. No one. So once you have like the relevant topic and a search bar and the topics are actually accurate, then you start to really improve like the quality of content that you're able to read and you as a consumer really are able to get the information that you need in order to make a buying decision. Yep. Yeah. What do you think about curating reviews from other platforms? Do you guys also incorporate like Amazon and Walmart.com and like how do you show in a holistic way where I also yeah. think like a lot of those consumers are very different people who shop at Walmart are different than Amazon versus you know on your website yeah, yeah so we don't in general we are big believers that like we need to authenticate like I mentioned how we started that these are like real people that actually bought your product so we just do it from like the content we generated mm -hmm. I can tell you in our photos we curate from like Instagram or Pinterest because we think that makes sense actually from like specific hashtag or specific accounts that of the brand. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I'll give you like another example that's been explosive for us. So let's say if you are a brand that want to increase your review count, right? Let's say you sell a lot on Amazon, you sell a lot like direct, but you, you want to increase your review count on your direct SMS, the best example. So our integration, when you can send review requests through SMS, mm -hmm. amazing, like just like amazing results. Like I highly recommend it for anyone that want to increase, you know, their social proof is to leverage SMS and SMS marketing. And, and this is why when for us, it's, you know, you use our SMS marketing product and reviews under the same data platform. That's what we work, like our platform team 
platform team works on is to make that experience as like literally a click of a button, mm -hmm. like send review request and that that's it. So I think in general, we are not a big believer from curation of content. It's more about generating that content and giving you more tools to generate authentic content that we can authenticate. Yeah, that's great. And I think just thinking about making things frictionless for the end user, I mean, that's going to change everything, especially with reviews. I'm thinking if you send me a text in SMS that just said, just review it and you don't pop me around to a million other places, exactly. I'll, you know, hit the start count. If I don't feel like adding in words right now, I won't, but making it easy to where I'll actually interact quickly, exactly. you know, I think is the way of the future. I mean, even earlier on Amazon, it was asking me to review something on my homepage. I tried to click five stars and it shot me over to another page and wanted me to write stuff. And then I just X'd out. I'm like, no too much work. I have two minutes before this interview. And I was just trying to say, I like my pair of shorts I bought. I can tell you it's the same thing in loyalty, by the way, we see that like loyalty, because loyalty, we, you also see that in brands, right? Loyalty is a very complex problem. Mm -hmm. In order for a brand now to launch a loyalty program, they need to give it some thought. It's not like a cookie cutter because every brand has their own thing. But on the, on the flip side, if the experience won't be like that easy for the consumer mm -hmm. or frictionless for the consumer, consumers won't engage with the loyalty program. So this is why we really focused on building an experience that it's going to be really easy for your consumers to understand what's in it for me and how to engage with your loyalty program. Because if not, if it's like you said, a link to another page and then I need to, it's not going to happen. They're not going to join to your loyalty uh, club. So in general, in every product that we have, we are very, very focused on a very frictionless consumer experience because we learned like so many times, it won't work if it's complicated. It mm -hmm. just won't. Yep. How do you think about building up a good loyalty program? I'm sure a lot of your clients ask, like, you know, what are some pitfalls that you've seen before and how do I make it frictionless and fun and engaging? Like, how would you yeah. advise them on creating one from scratch? Yeah, th th there's a lot, actually. And it's a, it's a complex topic that we are super passionate about. If I need to summarize it, I'll say that one, like I mentioned, complex problem, but it has to be like an easy, easy consumer experience. Second, it's not one size fits all. Like you really need to understand, okay, what do you want to incentivize for? So let's take Chubby's, another example that we started, like Chubby's has like a great loyalty program across uh, categories. So let's say if you buy shorts, they want you to buy a t-shirt, they will incentivize you with points to do that. That's like super, super important. So for Chubby's, the point system, to it's basically like a mechanism to incentivize certain behavior that you want, that works extremely well. So you need to figure out what behaviors do you want to encourage? Another example is Third Love. Yep, I don't know if you're familiar with that brand. So they also use our uh, loyalty program. For them, it was all about like the brand, meaning they didn't want to use a point system. They actually wanted to use like a VIP uh, tier system. So you do certain action or you spend a certain amount and then you get like certain VIP tiers levels that you can get different perks from, you know, free shipping, products, discounts, whatever you want. And that's been working phenomenally well for them. In 2021, you have to have a loyalty program. I think like we are past the days that, you know, yeah, I'm not sure. Like you are losing a lot of money, you're leaving a lot of money on the table, but you need to first figure out what do you want to incentivize for? Like, what is the behavior you want to encourage? That's like super, super important. Then, okay, what are you willing to give and how do you make it easy for consumers to engage on site? In email, you can send like different emails. You can run like different social campaigns or social, you know, contests. There's like a bunch of things. But eventually, it's all about how do you build a relationship with your most important customers, right? With the customers that like you care the most on. So it's a very emotional experience on one end. On the other end, it's that simple. You need to see how why it's all about like customer lifetime value. So the analytic needs to be like, you know, if, uh, if you're not sure if your loyalty program is not working or not, it's probably it doesn't work because yeah. it's very easy to understand that it's working. It's about increasing customer lifetime value. I think that's a good point too about knowing your customer and what they're going to want to see. I mean, for something like a third love, I can see why they want to be seen as it's more premium. You're part of the club. I mean, we're so much more higher end than exactly. a Victoria's Secret or whatever, you know, whoever else they're competing with versus the Chubbies. Like they're, you know, their client probably doesn't need to see that to feel like they're part of the club. They just want the product. Exactly. So that's an interesting It's such point. a strong brand that if you buy Chubbies, you're already part of the club. It's like one of the the best ways, uh, definitely. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you another example, maybe yeah. that can give you like, also to share you some light about the connectivity. Let's take another one of our customers that you probably know, Steve Madden. Mm -hmm. So let's say you are a junkie of sneakers. 
that's your thing in life, Stephanie. Like you are the number one that's in the me. VIPTO program. Uh-huh. Like literally number one. And then you get a sneakers and you give them a negative review because the shoelace was off or whatever. They want to like know me. about it. <laughs> <laughs> they want to know about it and they want to treat you a little bit differently. Mm-hmm. So taking that loyalty data and in, or the review data and injecting it back to loyalty and, and help desk and doing all of that is so, so important in order to provide a great con- consumer experience. That's the only way to do so. And we see that like time and time again, you cannot live with silo. Yep. Like that's the, one of the biggest tips that I can give is that whenever if you're, whenever if you're a Yotpo customer, you're not a Yotpo customer, it matters less. Like it, it's about the connected experience. Yeah, I mean, personalizing it is huge and having the customer not feel like they're talking into a black box. I mean, if I say, hey, I'm not happy with something. And then like you said, they're like, here's some points to just buy some more of it or something. That's probably yeah, so not a good tell you, I'll tell you another joke that we use internally. Yeah. Personalization, it's a, I, I hate it when product managers come to me and talk about personalization because I, I won't call it like a, the graveyard of e-commerce, but I think it's like the problem with, Personalization is an endless problem. Mm-hmm. Like there's always something to improve, but eventually, for the consumer, it's uh, the va- like there is a diminishing value in like keep on personalizing up until the point. So for us, it's more about look at sub segments of your customers and how you treat them differently, and how do you help the marketer really test and try certain things. But like trying to personalize it, like y- you can do that all day long, and it's it won't move the needle necessarily. So it's just about understanding from like that specific customer, what sub segment mm-hmm. they belong to. And then how do you treat that sub segment differently? Oh, that's, that's really interesting. I like that. I mean, it's not like everyone is a unique snowflake. However, they probably do fit in some buckets and you can treat those segments pretty similar and at exactly. least have methods for them. I like that. Exactly. So what kind of, I mean, I'm thinking about all this data that you guys are getting and the way that, you know, you're reacting to it and making new products and helping these brands, what kind of data is out there that I guess you could call it like dark data that you feel like could be tapped into, but you're like, we just haven't gotten there yet. But there's, there's always data that's out there that you feel like you're still not fully utilizing. Like what are brands usually have access to, but they're just not fully, you know, capitalizing on it. So, so from the brand or from your perspective? I say brand perspective. Yeah. So brand perspective, I think the most interesting thing is actually analyzing the content itself of the reviews. Mm -hmm. So it'll be like, I can give you like two examples. One of the best examples, which I love. Uh, Are you familiar with Adoremi? It's another array uh, from the East Coast, actually doing phenomenally well, a phenomenal uh, brand. So for them, we actually were able to analyze the content. We have an engine called Insights, uh, the natural language processing. And we learned something really interesting that a lot of the content was written like, I'm so happy my boyfriend bought me that and that. I'm so happy my husband did that. And we actually told him, you know what? We think you should launch a couple's line because a lot of your buyer persona, it's not the she, it's he buying for his girlfriend, for his wife, it doesn't matter. And it's one of the most successful launches they ever had. Or we have another like, uh, I don't know, furniture brand that I won't mention their name that we showed them that the number one reason for returns of the product is actually the smell of the sofa. And they need to fix that because they have a real problem in that. So actually looking at reviews as a, let's call it signal and that your ability to analyze on scale and have like a really uh, smart, again, NLP engine that can show you what customers are saying and slice and dice it per order volumes, per a customer behavior, per location, per segment is so, so important. You can get so much in, you know, product teams, marketing teams, uh, service teams for sure can get like to learn so much from it. So I think that's a data set that uh, a lot of brands are uh, not spending enough time looking at. Yeah. It makes me think gone are the days where you would have, you know, people come into a room and they try out your product and you hear feedback. It's like, wow, now you can just, you know, get thousands of data points, use NLP and digest the data and figure out how to change your product going forward. Makes it exactly that funny thinking about that. Okay, what about from a Yapo perspective? What kind of data do you want to get access to to inform either you know your current products or new ones? So something that we 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 think about a lot is it's very clear that you know commerce is going to be like omnichannel or is, and some of it will be marketplaces, 
most of it will be direct to consumers. Some of it maybe will be on social. Some of it maybe will be on Google. Like who knows, right? Everyone is trying that transaction will happen now at Instagram or on Google Shopping or whatever. And for us, it's, it's how do we give more value when you sell on Amazon? How do we give more value? Like we just launched a partnership with Walmart that you can syndicate all your content in, with the click of a button. If you sell also on Walmart, all of your content will be there as well. Uh, so you sell more on Walmart. So for us, it's really about how do we take more data and we are now working with like Facebook and Google on a bunch of like really, really interesting stuff. And how do we just help you to be a better omni-channel brand, I think. So, I mean, what kind of data then are you looking at to be a better omni-channel brand? Like what kind of things are you tapping into that maybe you weren't able to a couple of years ago? Yeah, so, so for us, with every new product that we add, mm-hmm. there's like a huge data injection, right? So just think about like, let's take SMS and loyalty. It's so valuable that you have the two products under the same data platform that you can really for the first time send like new SMSs for just your loyal customers. Mm -hmm. Just your highest VIP tier, you want to send them an SMS because you know that SMS will convert the best because they are your most loyal customer. So you can do that. You want to, I can tell you, I don't know, sending an SMS, just saying thank you. Thank you after someone referred a friend. Mm -hmm. You would be surprised how much that increased customer lifetime value. I always give our product team, like our uh, ideal experience is, let's say, Stephanie, once COVID will, let's say, once stores will start open up again, think about you going, buying at the store that you are like one of the most loyal customers, I don't know, buying at Third Love offline store once they'll have one. And then the, the second you walk out the door, you get an SMS, thank you for buying with us again. You, we really appreciate that. Mm-hmm. Like, how awesome is that? Like, who doesn't want to build that kind of a brand, right? Yeah. So I think from a data standpoint, the more products that we have, we really understand better the different segments of your customers and make it easy for you to launch different campaigns. So for us, SMS, for example, was a huge addition. That's something that we didn't have, like a, a new execution layer. And loyalty was a huge addition. And I think every product that we keep adding, we are learning much more on the brand. We're learning much more on the customers of the brand. Oh, I like that. Yeah, I mean... It definitely seems like there's a lot of room, especially for in-person retail experiences to kind of complete that journey and to also be helpful, you know, as you walk into a store, but to a point where it doesn't get creepy, where it's like, I see you in the makeup aisle right now. And I would go with this one over that one. Like that probably is taking it a little too far, but definitely, it still seems like there's room for brands to interact more because I don't get many messages right now. And the ones that I do are very generic and not helpful. And I sometimes wonder like, why don't my like a customer service rep, like take a picture and send it to me and be like, hope your day is going well. I think I would like something personal and funny like that more than just exactly. come in and get 20% off today. Yeah. And I can tell you like what we're hearing now from brands is that they are sending so many generic SMS that they actually like an SMS is on, like, it's not a cheap channel. Mm-hmm. It's not like email, right? Like you need to actually pay for the message for the carrier. So you really need to think carefully, like, okay, maybe for customers that gave me one star review, I need to ask a different SMS and send them, hey, how can I change the experience? I'm sorry, what can we do? Versus customers that raved about the price Mm -hmm. and maybe send them an SMS talking about like a discount or customers that talk about the service, say, send the picture of the customer service that helped them, right? Mm -hmm. So that connectivity is, I think, what's really, really important. Yep, yeah, I agree. So where do you see the world of, UGC in general transforming to over the next couple of years? Yeah, so I think UGC will definitely move towards a place that how do you take the content you're able to create and leverage that in multiple places in your email marketing, in your SMS marketing, on your social ads, on Walmart, on Amazon, on Etsy, on whoever you are as a brand, how you interact with consumers that's like where you need UGC to be at. So I think that's super, super important. The second thing is that, what do you understand from that UGC? Mm -hmm. That's something that I feel that as a company, we are just like at the tip of the iceberg. Like there's so much to be done there because this is like the most important signals from your customers. So that's something that we are very, very excited about. And the question is like, will there be like a new form of UGC, right? Stories, voice, there's like, a lot of things that we play around with in our hackathons to really trying to help pave the way of what's next in UGC. I can tell you, like it's very early, uh, like videos actually for now, 
for us now is like a new format that's also been uh, growing really, really quickly. Will there be like a new format? That's also really, really interesting. How do you view influencers versus UGC? Because the way the market's headed right now, I kind of wonder if like the whole influencer scene will start to kind of die off because people keep wanting more authentic interactions and relationships and they want to buy from people that feel more like them. Like, how do you see influencers playing yeah, out? So influencer this? is another uh, really interesting field. So first of all, I think it depends. Again, it's not a one size fits all. It really depends on like, what do you want to achieve with influencers? And I think people understand today that just giving the Kardashian your product doesn't necessarily mean that uh, you're going to increase sell. They, they can really, really help. And you can see Kylie Cosmetic. But the top influencer is actually building their own brands because they understand that's where the vast majority of revenue is. Mm -hmm. And that's something we see a lot in. So now you see like micro-influencers, right? Yep. And I think you, you probably need to do both uh, and different purposes. I think like uh, UGC is more like, let's say the basics. You need to have like social, social proof. And for me, influencer, it's more about like another channel, like paid, right? Like uh, Google ads, you now have like influencer ads if you want or influencer tax and, and it works and you need to do it very, very well, but it's actually not related to UGC. UGC, it's like the foundation of your brand. You cannot do Google ads. You cannot do influencer ads without it. So I think in general, influencer is really interesting, but I also think that brands and influencers today see that in order for it to work, they need to be authentic. Yep, yeah, I completely agree. Uh, all right, the last question before we jump into the lightning round, do you integrate with awesome platforms like our sponsor, Salesforce Commerce Cloud? Yes, definitely. So we yeah. are a big partner of Salesforce Commerce Cloud. We actually, I think, uh, one of the fastest growing solutions on Salesforce Commerce Cloud at the moment. And they've been great partners of ours. We have really amazing brands. We started with reviews. Now with loyalty, SMS is coming in like uh, just a few weeks, I think. It's one of the best platform for the enterprises that uh, we see in the market. Yep, I completely agree. With that, let's jump into the lightning round, which is brought to you by Salesforce Commerce Cloud. This is where I ask a question and you have 30 seconds or less to answer. Are you ready, Tomer? Of course. I was born ready. All right. If you were to have a podcast, what would it be about and who would your first guest be? Wow, what a great question. So I think if I, I need to do a podcast, it will be just on like great e-commerce stories. Mm -hmm. I think like uh, there's like one, one of the best people I know from the industry. There's like his name is Scott Perry. He's now like the leading everything uh, related to e-commerce in Jerome. Before that, he was in Bob's Furniture. He is just like freaking awesome. Okay. He's just like really, really awesome. And the other one that I really, really love is actually Lauren from uh, Shopify. Mm -hmm. He's another like really awesome person to spend time. He basically founded Shopify Plus. I like that. I mean, it might be a little competitive with our podcast. However, competition's healthy, so I'll accept it. <laughs> yeah, no, I think what you're doing, by the way, is super, super cool. He's awesome. like... Uh, it's, it's really, really interesting. And anyone in e-commerce should, like these are exactly the type of content that people should uh, should be listening to if you care Thank about e-commerce. I love that. Man, it's a good thing I brought you on. <laughs> what is the nicest thing anyone's ever done for you? The nicest thing that anyone ever done to me. So I think the, definitely I'll say like uh, my wife, we have like two young boys. So uh, she, she saw me in like some really, really tough nights. And she was there to really help me pass through those tough nights. So yeah, I would definitely give it to my wife. Shout out to your wife. I hope she listens to this. That's great. What one thing do you not understand today that you wish you did? How do you get a crying baby to stop crying? <laughs> I, after three boys, I still don't fully know that one. That's just a question that can't be answered. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And the last one, what is the last e-commerce purchase you made that you're most excited about? So I'm actually super excited. I don't know if you can see my background, but I bought uh -huh. from a Society6. It's one of our customers. I mean, it's actually like a great story to end with and that I think I can share about the Yotpo culture. So when we founded Yotpo, you know that how every startup is saying that they started at a basement and yada, yada. Mm -hmm. So our office was a real basement, meaning it was like an apartment building. You would go down, turn left. There was no light, no nothing. And even for people that were willing to interview for a two-people startup, we got some feedback that the office is too hardcore. Mm -hmm. And we didn't have money for furniture <clears throat> and we didn't know what to do. 
So a story for a different time, I had a bunch of like Sesame Street puppets at my apartment. So I brought them to the office and that started to be our vibes. Mm -hmm. And then when we moved to like a real office, we took them with us. And then when we started opening offices across the globe, people thought that they need to bring like Sesame Street stuff with them. And then when we moved to the home office in COVID, I said, okay, we need to bring Sesame Street stuff. So I bought from Society6. So we'll never forget where we're coming from. So I think that's uh, maybe one of the things I'm most excited about. And I just bought, actually, you know what? There's another one because I'm I keep buying from our customers. That's my thing in life. I buy just from our customers. And there's like an aura ring that helps you sleep better and analyze your sleep. I don't know if you're familiar with that. No, what's it called? Ring, it's like really, really, I don't know if people can see, but it's like. Let's see. You can explain it to anyone who just. Yeah, listening. it's like, it's a ring that basically tracks with an app, tracks how you sleep, how you need to give you like let's say, uh, guidance on how to better sleep. Mm -hmm. And so I'm super excited to test it. It just arrived today and I'm going to test it. So Ooh, excited wonder, about that. What things do you think it'll tell you like to sleep better, uh, quarantine your kids I, off in a room where you can't hear them or? I wish, I wish someone would tell us that. Yes. <laughs> hey, you'll have to tell me how that works. That sounds awesome. Well, Tomer, thanks so much for joining the show. It's been a pleasure. Where can people find out more about you and Yatpo? Yeah, so first of all, thank you for having me. It's like, uh, it's a pleasure. And I think like uh, we in Yotpo like are, are big fans of the podcast, by the way. we yeah. There are a few episodes that we mentioned. It's actually like a thing. Oh, uh, so you can just go to Yotpo if you want to. Me personally, it's like tomer at yotpo.com. It's nothing too special. And feel free to reach out. Amazing. Thanks so much. Thank you for having me. Hey listeners, thanks for tuning into this episode. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. If you haven't already, please subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. It helps spread the word and I would greatly appreciate it. See you next time. Up Next in Commerce is brought to you by Salesforce Commerce Cloud and created by the team at mission.org. Subscribe now at Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts.